I would like to begin by welcoming once again all of you who have taken the time to come out and to um, participate in this um, very important event. Um, it has taken a lot of effort and work on behalf of a number of people to um, come together and um, sort of uh, develop sort of uh, presentations and notes related to the subject of uh, hydraulic fracturing uh, and um, its practice within, um, you know, our traditional territory of Mi'kma'ki. And so uh, welcome, Dr. Wheeler, for taking the time to come out. And I'd um, like to recognize, I believe it's Margo, for uh, coming out. And Deborah, thank you for making it to this event. I'll begin by introducing myself. My name is Chief Paul Prosper. I am the chief here in Bakunke. I am also the uh, lead uh, for the assembly in the portfolio of energy. And the assembly, it is known as the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs. Uh, it is, it exists as an institution of governance for the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. And uh, I am, we are here on behalf of the assembly to provide you with our comments on the subject of hydraulic fracturing. We view this as a preliminary dialogue and uh, hope that um, further discussions ensue um, with government and on this particular very important topic for the Mi'kmaq. We don't consider this part of an Aboriginal, Aboriginal engagement process. Rather, this is something that we initiated on our own accord. So uh, we just wanted to make note of that. Um, we have uh, assembled a, um, a group of presenters, um, and I'll just briefly introduce them. Uh, Albert Marshall, who is a respected Mi'kmaq elder, an advocate, a visionary. And it's my distinct honor and pleasure to be sitting at the same table with him. Um, Dee Campbell, who uh, is with the Union of Nova Scotia Indians, and she'll provide her position to you. You know, um, James or Jim Walsh, who is with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. Uh, Michael Cox, who is with the Willamook Mwa uh otherwise known as the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative, and Twyla Goodet, who is also with the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative. I'd like to start out by providing a, a, a general, what I consider to be a legal framework, just to sort of contextualize these discussions. As you uh, may or may not know, the Mi'kmaq here in Nova Scotia have existing Aboriginal and treaty rights. Uh, these rights have been recognized and affirmed by the highest court in this country on several occasions, the Supreme Court of Canada, and is uh, embedded, enshrined within the constitutional framework of Canada, within the constitution, which is the highest law within Canada. And certainly, um, the existence of Aboriginal and treaty rights has a special place within many communities, and particularly within this community. Um, for example, uh, one of our community members, Tom Tillaboy, some time ago was charged uh, fishing salmon. That led to a case known as the Denny Paul and Tillaboy case, which was relied upon by the Sparrow case, a Supreme Court of Canada judgment. And so, um, you know, that's sort of one of the lead sort of cases that sort of uh, was brought forward by the Mi'kmaq that recognized an Aboriginal right to uh, fish for food. Years later, um, we, we had a, a, an incident just off our lands known as Walneg, otherwise known as the Cove in Mi'kmaq. It's only a 10-minute uh, drive from here where uh, Donald Marshall Jr. was charged for fishing eels, which uh, led to the um, Donald Marshall Jr. fishing case. So, you know, these incidents, uh, you know, um, play a role within the minds of uh, our community members and certainly within the Mi'kmaq Nation in general. 
And what they basically speak to, the recognition of Aboriginal and treaty rights, it's the recognition of basic legal, and not just legal, but human rights. The rights of the Mi'kmaq to uh, live and to sustain ourselves from our own lands and resources and to share uh, those lands and resources with the public in general. And often when we hear of Aboriginal and treaty rights, so we often view it as a bear, barrier, but uh, I view it as not being a bear, barrier, but rather a principled framework which allows for the sustainability of development to uh, occur on our traditional lands. So um, it is that framework that I would like to talk a bit, a bit, a bit more about. Within this framework, there's always a balance. Uh, there's a balance in pretty well whatever um, is sort of discussed, uh, especially uh, as it relates to uh, the, the use of resources and things like that. And certainly for the Mi'kmaq, there has been a balance. You know, with rights come responsibilities. And for the Mi'kmaq, there's a, there's a sense on... Um, a dialogue in terms of what is best for our communities and how can we look to maintain that balance. Um, and it is this principle uh, framework that is consistent with Section 35, which recognizes and affirms the existing rights, Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Mi'kmaq. Part of this dialogue involves consultation and uh, consultation will be further discussed in more detail, but essentially what guides the consultation pro process with government is this concept known as the honor of the crown, where government is obliged to act in an honor honorable fashion in their dealings with Aboriginal peoples across this country. And the general sort of uh, upshot of that is to seek out some kind of reconciliation. A reconciliation that exists from the prior occupation and sovereignty of Aboriginal peoples with the existing assertion of sovereignty of the Crown. So it, it looks and seeks to reconcile that balance that exists between the Mi'kmaq and the Crown. So uh, just a bit of a note there on consultation. Obviously, there are certain instruments like the uh, Declaration, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of an Indigenous Peoples that uh, recognizes, you know, Indigenous sort of rights and um, the right to access and benefit from lands and resources, the right to be self-determined, to determine our own destiny. And uh, Article 19 of that declaration speaks to the the need for um, free, prior, and informed consent, uh, uh, government allowing that to exist amongst Indigenous peoples when they're, uh, before they adopt any legislative or administrative uh, measures that may impact or affect our rights both today and in the future. So it is instruments such as these, uh, the Declaration and uh, the Constitutional Framework of Canada, that essentially provides a basis uh, of our right to health and to live in a healthy environment. And it also provides basic legal and human recognition, and recognition of human rights to provide a basic livelihood for ourselves from the lands and the resources and to be self-determined in that regard. A bit about the format and process of this sort of presentation. Um, a number of presenters will be providing um, various comments from both a scientific and cultural perspective. Uh, some preliminary issues will be identified and these will not be exhaustive. They just represent some of the key issues and obviously this will provide a uh, fertile soil for uh, a future consultative process under uh, the consultation terms of reference which is the preferred means of consultation for the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia which involves uh, all three levels of government the federal provincial and Mi'kmaq governance 
uh, under this particular process. Uh, a bit on the Mi'kmaq worldview. Um, central to the Mi'kmaq worldview is essentially how we see our relationship to the world that we live in. A grand chief of long ago uh, equated our existence to uh, like a, a grass that sprout, sprouts from the ground and certainly our creation story confirms our existence within our traditional territory, the territory of Mi'kma'ki. Throughout the years our health and well-being uh, depends largely upon the health and well-being of our lands and resources. So within that regard, we are certainly connected. Uh, we are not separate, and we all share this deep and profound connection to the earth, to the land, and to the resources. Um, one of the things I was thinking about in preparation of this sort of discussion, it led me to think about water. And as you've heard from uh, the opening prayer, water has specific and special meaning for the Mi'kmaq. Um, many, for example, believe that it is the women that are the keepers of water. And um, as was suggested as well, is within each of us possess a certain masculine and feminine quality. Uh, in terms of how we interact and un come to understand water. And I often thought, you know, if water could be sit, you know, at this table before you here today, what would she say? Um, what would be the message of water? The, the message of water cannot be exclusively realized through the activities of the mind. Um, for it is through the heart that we do come to uh, get into a fuller understanding on the message of water. It is through the heart that we come to recognize and realize our own message from water. And so, almost like the beat of a drum, the sacredness of water flows within each of us. It is like the blood that courses through our veins. Most of our body is comprised of water, and it is an intimate part of who we are. We are part of it, and it is part of us, and we do not see a separation. The heart's recognition of water and the roles it plays can awaken our own fractal lines within our human bodies. It is through this process that we will start to remember, and I say re-hyphen member, our own unique relationship to water and the responsibility that we all share to preserve it. We all have a relationship with water. It is a flow, a natural rhythm, that is deeply embedded within our hearts. If we take the time to listen and to feel its presence, we begin to understand that it is a vital element as to who we are. Through remembering, we can begin to know its purpose, which is the purpose of all humanity. This is to live in harmony with the natural world, which really means to live in harmony with ourselves. To understand hydraulic fracturing and its impact on water, we must attempt to balance uh, the risks and benefits associated with it. What is the price paid? For what reward? And who really benefits? We must fully understand the risk to make informed decisions. This practice of hydraulic fracturing intersects with the Mi'kmaq worldview from a variety of perspectives. These include a scientific, cultural, and spiritual perspective. And is these perspectives that are further expanded upon through a number of present presenters. And um, at, at this stage, um, I'm gonna pass it over to Albert Marshall.